Welcome to the chat room. I'm here today with Stephanie. She is the owner of Bella Rococo at Amelia's. And we're gonna learn a little bit about how she got into the industry and any tips and tricks she has for everybody. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you for joining. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So to start off, um, do you wanna share with everybody what your current job is? I know you're the owner, but you do other things at the salon as well. Yeah. So hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Savino and I am the salon owner of Bella Rococo at Amelia Salon in Garwood, New Jersey. I am a hairstylist, makeup artist, and we also branch out and doing on-site hair and makeup for primarily bridal, but any kind of special event. So it's been a very busy roller coaster ride, but very, very exciting. I bet. Yeah. It's been quite an adventure this 2020. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so I know that you are doing it now and you've been doing it for quite a while, but you didn't actually start out in this industry as your full-time job. Um, do you want to share kind of what you started out in once you sure. graduated? So I actually went to Monmouth University. I graduated in 2003 with a degree in criminal justice because I really thought I was going to be a police officer. And I really wanted to be Olivia Benson from like Law and Order SVU. Yes. <laughs> and I took a couple tests and it just like didn't really pan out. And then I started working in security positions. One was in a, a high school doing like security and helping out with like the social worker. Mm -hmm. And then I, I worked in corporate and Prudential doing various things from human resources to life insurance claims. And then I decided in 2005 that I really wanted to do something different. And I thought originally I was going to do aesthetics, which is when you go to the spa and you have your facial or your waxing or whatever. So I applied for, to apply for Artistic Academy. It's a beauty school in Moraines, New Jersey, which is like Northwest. And I was like, I'm going to be in the spa. It's going to be amazing. My beauty teacher, Miss Jenny, who's still my mother to this day, was, was like, you're too loud and too talkative. You're never going to be able to do it. You should really do makeup. So I'm like, okay. I mean, I didn't know anything about makeup. I didn't even own a lot of makeup. But she made me work on everyone all the time, buy all these books, and just practice, practice, practice. So when I graduated, she said, you're going to go to the Mac counter, and you're going to apply. Now, this is like, was still the heat of, like, everybody loved Mac, and it, they were, like, the only real line, but I didn't know anything about them, so I just walk up to the mall in Short Hills in the Mac store right before holiday, and I said to the manager, I want to work here, but I have no experience, but I just want to work here. I don't know if she felt bad for me or she liked me, but she gave me a shot as a freelancer and got in there, but I was still working corporate at the same time, so I would go to corporate, my corporate job, and then I would go do the makeup on the side. And that's when I really started doing bridal. And at that time we were just for makeup, that's it. Hmm. And in 2008, I got a part-time job in a salon doing front desk reception and makeup. And I, wow, I, I really wish I would have went to school for hair, but I was always scared because you know, with hair, once you cut it off, like it's gone. If you do makeup and you mess up, you could just wipe it off and start over. So I'm like, you know what? If I don't go now, I'm never going to go. So while I was working still in corporate, I would go to beauty school part time. And then I still worked at the salon on the weekends. And that program took me longer because I went part time. So it was about two years. And then I got my license. And then I started my internship at that salon, my apprenticeship. And about this time, I was about to be 30, and I said, I can't move on in the salon if I'm not full-time. So I literally took the jump of faith and just quit corporate and was like, you know what? I'll just figure it out. But I always knew I wanted my own salon. I just knew that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I was at that salon for about 11 years, and last June, I um, got a really great opportunity on the space I am now and took another jump and opened. So it's been a really crazy ride. Everyone laughs at me because they're like, you've worked everywhere and done like everything. But it makes you, when you look back, it kind of connects the dots to what it to be. It yeah. just like took me a little longer. But I have no regrets about going to college first. I really had a 
good college experience. I pledged my sorority. I'm a sister Lambda Theta Alpha. Um, I'm really proud of that, and I'm proud of what I went to school for. I don't think it was a complete waste. Um, but it's funny because I always wonder how it would have been if things didn't happen this way, but then I always know this is how it was supposed to be because mm -hmm. I just love it, you know? So it's crazy how you get to where you're supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, very roundabout. But like you said, you picked up skill sets and things that kind of tie into what you're doing now. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when you work in corporate, it's a totally different vibe. It's a totally different energy. Mm -hmm. And you learn how to handle yourself with certain things. You learn how to work in crazy stressful environments. You learn just people and like psychology of people. And when you work behind the chair, you're more than just cutting and coloring and doing makeup. I mean, you're on someone's head and in five minutes of meeting a new guest, you have to get them to trust you to touch their hair because they don't know you, you know? So it's a lot of psychology. We get a lot of their problems, their happy moments, their sad moments. So it's a lot that you get out from all those other things that got me here. I feel like it made me just be a better stylist and owner, you know? So it's, it's been good. So to jump back, you mentioned that you were in a sorority. Um, I would never was in a sorority. So what was that like? How was that? And, you know, did you gain any life skills from being in a sorority and working in a large group? Um, a pro Greek person. I feel going Greek in college is a really great experience. My sorority, um, we were a smaller one at the at that at my mom at the time. But they once you get in and you have a leadership position, you're running essentially a small little business because you have to have fundraisers, you have to recruit, you have to have like mini your meetings, you have to have a budget, you have to do philanthropy efforts you have to still maintain your academics and work with other organizations so I feel for me the net alone that I've gotten from being in my sorority because you don't just mix with mom if you mix with everybody because it's such a broad thing so I feel it's definitely opened a lot of doors for me it's really great friendships and I think as a whole I definitely think if it's something you're interested in doing and you're in college you should definitely go for it I mean, it's not for everyone, but I would at least go to an information session and check it out because I definitely think there's a lot of pros to being a part of um, a sorority or a fraternity. Yeah. And you said that, um, you know, once you started developing your career, you kind of knew that your end game was to own a salon. So what are the things that you had to do in order to take those steps to actually become a salon owner? It's funny because I get this question so many times and I had a plan in my mind, right? <laughs> I didn't have anything really written down because I really thought, and it's crazy how universe worked. I thought I was going to open this year, which thank God I opened last year and not this year. So um, I think to open as, well, first of all, to open a salon, you need a manager who has a license, a cosmetology license for three years. You can open one and not technically be licensed, but you need a manager. So you're not a hairstylist or you're not a licensed cosmetologist. You can't, you can own it, but you can't really run it, if that makes sense. Anything I told people, I said, I had really, I didn't have the game plan, but in going back that it's been a year, <clears throat> excuse me, you definitely want to have a budget you definitely want to have the type of services that you want to have, your price list, a very good lawyer, a very good accountant, because yeah. if you've never worked with Quick, it's a whole other, like this is not just Microsoft Word, it's a lot. And essentially you're responsible for someone and their family and their livelihood. And if you can't sacrifice the time in the beginning to really build it, it's not for you. You have to dedicate a lot of time, a lot of sweat, a lot of hard work to building something because you have to essentially create a clientele. You have to create a vibe and you have to connect within your community. So I think having a business plan written, I mean, just to say my story, I started looking for places last year early last 2019 and my aunt actually owns this building that I'm in she's been doing wow. here for 60 years wow. this was her salon but I didn't know we just randomly came me my mom and my son 
I said, oh, and Amelia, can I just come by? I want to pick your brain about, oh, you know, because I'm like, well, here, she like did it. I'll pick her brain. Yeah. And unbeknownst to me, this place was for rent on Zillow, but I didn't know that. So when I came in, it was, to I mean, they had the station, but it was to but my heart. I just knew that this was the space. Like I was like, no, this is it. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but this is it. However, the way it's split is somebody else wanted to rent the back for like a physical therapy place or something. Mm -hmm. So I only had like 24 hours to make a decision. So I went to some my parents and I was just, cause I have a son and you know, and like, if you don't do this now, you're never going to do it. You've been talking about this for years. Like just, you're going to do it. So then I went to the bank, I got my small business loan. I started joining um, like the small business association, women in business associations, just to kind of get mentors and help with exactly what you need to do, how to really um, grow a business and stuff like that. And I was fortunate because when I did work in any kind of salon or beauty environment, I always worked from the bottom. So I understood some of the back end work. I understood like customer service, the front desk aspect. So I think if you want to own your own salon, you have to realize, you have to know how to manage your appointment book and hire a front or hire a manager to help you and control inventory and control your cost. And there's a lot that goes behind that people really don't see. Is it the hardest thing in the world? No. But if you really want it, that's what's going to push you to constantly do it and thrive because your passion will fuel you. Even on the days where you're doubting yourself or you say, I don't know how I'm going to do this. It, that passion and that love for the field will carry you through. And you can always ask. I tell my team all the time, if I don't know something, I ask. I ask somebody else who knows and we find out the answer because they know we're in our year. We hit our year, June 4th. So we're just a year in. So we're still learning going and we're developing. So it's a constant. You, you just have to be open and transparent and be willing to ask for help and you'll be fine. So you've reached a year. Um, part of that year has been staying open and, and working through and dealing with a pandemic. So what has it been like being a business owner, a new business owner, and kind of navigating through a pandemic, which none of us have really done before? This pandemic has been insane for everyone, but it's so funny because we closed New Jersey shut down salons March 19th. I shut down March 17th because the staff, we were all kind of getting nervous. And to me, I felt the risk wasn't higher than the reward, meaning the money. I couldn't risk my staff to work feeling uncomfortable, people getting sick. What if people come in? There was too many risks that to me, I was just like, you know what? It's going to be three weeks anyway. That's why I was like, it'll be fine. It'll be like three weeks. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> months and months later. However, I will say the pandemic, as crazy as it's been, as stressed as it's been, has given us an opportunity to completely re-strategize and catapult our business to where we want it to be because in the beginning you really don't have that kind of time you're always like running running on the go so when you have to stop and really look at your systems look at your social media strategy look at your marketing strategy it kind of gave us that time and we also got creative extremely quick because when you have nothing coming in i mean the restaurants yes they had curbside they had take we didn't have that yeah we started basic with the um selling products we were fortunate to team up with one of our distributors that would ship it so we didn't even have to like run up because no one really not everyone lives in this area so who's driving around new jersey i mean we would have did it but that just makes no sense yeah the second thing we did was we brought on a line for our hair and um our skincare and makeup collection that we have here it's fine life by alcone they shipped it out we didn't have to do anything with that mm -hmm. Then we teamed up with the borough. They got us on a, a new website for um, purchasing gift cards. That went really well. And then we went into a local company in Cranford called Think Design Print, teamed up with all local businesses to make t-shirts. So it was like, it looked like, um, like this one. Oh, let me just stand up. So it's just like our logo on a black t-shirt and it was $20. So then they got 10 and we got 10. So we sold about, 65 
I think we were, and we're number five out of like all the businesses. And it's crazy because we're not technically in Cranford. So we were like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then yeah. the, the thing that really helped us was we teamed up with DP Hue. We did the at-home color kits for, especially for people with grays. And yeah. then we were selling, they had like glazes. So that really helped us. And because a lot of us didn't get unemployment for, I hit, I think 11 weeks because when you're self-employed, employed a lot of my team didn't get it for a while some of them did some of them didn't that's why i said like have a really good accountant who can help you with your questions but at the end of the day we persevered we're open to third we're extremely booked so i mean you just have to be you you really after this i feel like there's nothing that can happen that i cannot come over and you just have to just stay calm and do the best that you can each day. And I love Shark Tank. And now one of the things they said was when you're an owner, just be transparent with your, and we really persevered and had our weekly Zoom meetings. And even if we had nothing really about work to talk about, we would just constantly stay in contact with each other. We really tried to stay connected to our clients and our social media, but it's been wild. Like to, to think we lost like the year, it's, it's in, cause we pretty much lost the whole second quarter. You know, so it's like wild, but we're excited to come back. We're excited to come back stronger. I think if you can make it through this, you're good. Cause a lot of businesses are not coming back and it's really, really sad. It's really, really sad. Yeah. I have been seeing a lot of closures out here too, where we are. And, um, it is, it's sad businesses that have been around for a while. So it is nice to see, you know, a business that started fairly recently still, you know, making it. And oh, absolutely. Open. So how do you handle, you know, explaining all these events? Because you've mentioned that you're a mom and you have a young child at home. So how do you handle explaining everything that's going on right now, including, you know, pandemic and the Black Lives Matter moment and um, like school closures and, you know, mom not going to work because it's been closed. Like that's a lot for children to be taking in and absorbing and understanding. How have you kind of navigated that? So my son's name is Luciano. He's three years old. He does attend a preschool. Yeah. I don't know what he thought in the beginning. He probably thought it was great because we had more time together. So we just, I'm very close to my sister. My sister has two kids, an eight-year-old and a four-year-old. So they, the eight-year-old, he knew more. Well, he actually is not eight yet. He's seven. They knew coronavirus. They knew there was a virus or the virus because the B's and V's get mixed up. It's so funny. So they knew we couldn't go anywhere because there was a virus. So in the beginning, it was still winter, so it wasn't that bad. But he never went anywhere. But it didn't really register until... He was like, well, where are we going to go shopping? He loves to go shopping. And I'm like, well, we're not going shopping. And he goes, I go to school. And I go, school's closed right now. So when they're little, they really don't understand. As he, then his preschool was great. They had three times a week Zoom calls for like a hour. We did a little project or they had dancing or they did whatever they were doing. So he at least got to see, he didn't get that at first, but you'd be surprised at three, they really do can get the concept of Zoom. Yeah. And then little by little, if I brought him, he would come to the shop. He always comes here. So at least he felt that he got to go somewhere. And then we would hang out with my sister and her kids and I would take her daughter because they were like friends. So we would do stuff like that. In regards to now, he just went back to school yesterday. They just reopened. I constantly made him put a little mask on to get, but I told him he's a superhero because he can't have the germs. So he goes, no germs, no germs. And he knows he's, he's a superhero because they have, when you're over two and a half, you have to wear it. They're not going to make them keep it on, but like if, for the most part, you have to walk in with it on. So he's good with wearing his mask. He understands like washing his hands. He understands like really go everywhere. But he doesn't really know, so it's that part isn't bad. When Black Lives Matter really happened with the whole George Floyd incident, my son is Italian, Irish, Puerto Rican, and Dominican. I've always made it a point, and his father as well, as we co-parent, because we, um, we've been co-parenting since he's two months, we always make it a point to involve him in both aspects of his culture. For me, I wanted him 
to see what was going on to see the movement that was happening because it's I really believe like that generation is really going to catapult it to where it's going to be. So when he's in school and they hear talk about 2020, he can be like, yeah, I saw it and I was around it. Yeah. I'm very much exposed to all cultures, his religion, sexual orientation. I did drive him through um, a protest that was happening in our town and he didn't, he goes, they're outside and he was waving and he was at the everyone. So I don't know. He, I know he didn't understand what it was, but I just said to him, you know, this is how you bring out about change and you use your voice to make a difference. And he very much, I think kind of got that because he is, I'm not saying because he's my son, but he does understand you because I don't really talk to him. Like me, I kind of just talk to him like how it is. Mm -hmm. And as he grows up, it's just a matter of reinforcing that, re reinforcing that you have to be a kind person, you have to be a respectful person, and, you know, understand history through what's happened the last, how many, and even in his cultural, like, the Hispanic side, and like the Italian side, and the Irish side, so that he understands, so that he can be an educated person just being a nice kind person because at the end of the day I feel like as parents we just want to raise respectable nice kind people so yeah. as long as you can do that I feel like you're good so and I think that's for me right now that's like all I can do for him is just just expose him to as many different things as possible so that he got in his, like he's used to it you know and like you have open conversation and you know um even with my nephew and my niece like sometimes even talking about where like why me and his father aren't married you know like it's no different you just have to have those conversations i think that's what's if anything comes out of what's going people are having dialogue with whether mm -hmm. You agree or disagree but just to actually be talking about it will create more change and more movement so for my son like that's just we just have the conversation we bought like the little books that they like we watched the sesame street thing that was like really great because they kind of like broke it down really good and like they understand mm -hmm. and you know that's all like you as, as this moves forward you just keep exposing them to everything so that they get a really so they get, become more well-rounded you know Right, but he well, he would did a drive by in in a, in a protest. <laughs> I saw the video. It was it was very yeah. beautiful. Just kind of seeing him take it all in. Yeah, because even when we did the make some noise, like how Hoboken and New York and Jersey City were doing every third every night at seven o'clock for the healthcare workers, the frontliners, the police. Like he was out there. We did it every Thursday, and he hanging his own hand. So to show appreciation and to be from a grateful, have an attitude of gratitude is important for me, for Tim. So, you know, he does all that, you know, so he's, he's, I just think it makes him more well-rounded, you know, so at least he could say he like knew about it, you know what I mean? So <laughs> he can, he can be a part of it, you know? Yeah, he's a part of it. Exactly. Yeah. So do you have any tips for any people out there who are juggling, you know, family and being business owners or just, you know, working in general, that work-life balance? It's so funny because I never like to use the word balance. I like <laughs> the word like harmony because I just don't believe you can really have balance. Mm -hmm. And I used to that you could like you can't have it all because something suffers. You'll like kill it at work one day and then you feel like you just suck as a mom. Like my first year, I'm extremely grateful. I have my parents that have truly been there for me. I have an amazing school that he goes to. Thank God they're great, you know, and his father is there in his life to help. If I need him, I can call on him because you, you have to be here. I will tell you though, my tip for people, which I'm still constantly, because I'm a continuous work in progress, can't, don't work, what is this saying? You don't live to work, you work to live. Like, don't be so busy working that you have to create a life. And as an entrepreneur, it's crazy because you just love it. 
Like I would come here every day and love it. Doesn't matter. But then you want, you can burn yourself out. So the only thing I would say to someone, actually a working mother is a, as a business owner, you really need your village. Like you need good people, whether it's your family, friends, you have um, child, babysitter, your partner, you have to have honest communication on what you expect and what you really want because you can own and thrive and be successful, but you have to have support because you cannot do it all by yourself. Like you just can't. And if you can, then I applaud you and I'm here for it. But I mean, you really need a good sense of community around you for the business. You have to take care of yourself. You have to eat properly. You have to make sure that you get downtime because you, the burnout, especially in the first year is very real. For me in February, I got diagnosed with strep and the flu at the same time. And I could not come here for a week. And thank God I have, the, my mom's convinced I had coronavirus, but I didn't get tested or not. I don't think so. I had the strep, but whatever. <laughs> thank God I have a good team because they were, I didn't have to worry. I followed up with them, but I knew, and that's, you have to align yourself with good people. When you're bringing people in, don't just bring people in, really interview people and really build a team of people who are in a collective state of mind and want to drive the business, but also build something with you. And, you know, you have to be able to delegate. It's very hard in the beginning because most entrepreneurs, I feel like are borderline control freaks. And you're like, well, if I could do it better. I'll just do it. But you can, you have to delegate and you just have to have faith in yourself and really believe in yourself. And as sometimes it gets scary, sometimes you're, you're learning and maybe you didn't hit your margins and you're like, okay, well, what am I going to do? But you just have to believe that it's going to work and always be open to taking criticism, taking suggestions and, you know, going from there, but definitely taking care of yourself, I feel is crucial, especially for women, especially for moms. You run, 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 run. And then you're like, did I even eat today? Like there's so much, they laugh at me at work. Like, did you even eat yet? And I'm like, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. But you want to work smarter, not harder. So I think in terms of business woman owner, I think definitely get involved and network. Like where you join the chamber of commerce, join your chamber of commerce, join other organizations, support others, in community. When I first got here, I walked up the whole street and introduced myself to everyone. I'm like the mayor on the street. I know everyone. You have to be a part of the town you're in and, and do community outreach. That's really big for us. We always do some sort of monthly charitable um, thing. And I just think you have to just, at the end of the day, just believe that this is what you're doing and you'll be fine. But you have to take care of yourself. You can't, you have to put your mask on before you help others in the plane. You know, like that is the truest thing ever. Yeah. That little card tells you to do it. Yeah. First. <laughs> that, it's true though. And people don't, people forget and they, they just run, run, run. I mean, and I, I'm a definite workaholic. Like if, if there's workaholics anonymous, I will go, I will definitely <laughs> go. But I've learned it's just, it's not, especially with my son, my son is my biggest Five and my reality check because I've slowed down for him, but I work harder for him, but in different ways, you know. And like right now, he's in school, so I'm here in this. It's my office. I'm working because when I pick him up, I'm like I can't, I don't work anymore. Like I'm present with him. Mm -hmm. So you have to divvy up because essentially you open a business to have more time. <laughs> you don't get it in the beginning, but essentially you want to have the time to do with the things you want to do. So, you know, you just have to really try your best. And if one day you know, they ate cereal for dinner, whatever, it's fine. And if one day, you know, they were amazing and like you didn't do that, you know, you're going to have good and bad days and you just have to roll with the punches. To end this on some fun stuff, uh, yeah. do you have any horror stories about like any hairdos you've ever gotten or given or like any great amazing stories of like, oh my God, this is the best? Um, horror stories. Hmm. <laughs> I know I've definitely tried to like dye my hair at home and it has turned out bad and I've had to go get it fixed and they have worked. I mean, 
I think the biggest horror that I had was I started off doing a lot of color corrections because I just love doing hair color. I just love it. And when you do a lot of color corrections, it helps you because you have to understand like underlying skin and mm -hmm. color theory and everything like that. This young girl came in, she was graduating high school and she had splat. You know what that is? No. Don't ever know splat is something that they sell over in the drugstores. And it's like a manic panic. So it's like pink and red and blue. But I don't know what they put in it. It's not come out. Bleach doesn't get it out. We could not get, her hair was like blue and purple. And I couldn't get, I could not get this out for the life of me. And she always wanted all these different colors. And I even called the company. I'm like, do you have a remover? Like, and if you put the lightener on it, it would make it brighter. And I was just like, oh my God, how am I going to fix it? Eventually we got it in something. Yeah. But it took such like sessions upon sessions. And that was my horror. So we all know, like, so we all say here, say no to splat. Like, don't do it. Like, really wash with those crazy colors. Like, don't just put them on your hair because you can't get them out, you know? Yeah. And then I had somebody really cut their own hair. Like, whoa. I, <laughs> and I had to, I mean, I had to fix it. But I'm sure we'll see some cute quor quarantine bangs and yeah. I'm here for it. You know, I'm here for it. You know, you had to do what you had to do. Sometimes you get bored. You can't see. So that's pretty much it. I mean, I really don't get like that horrified of things, but that color correction still to this day, like I tell everyone, I'm like, say no to splat. If I hear it, I'm like, oh my God, no, just, just don't. <laughs> don't do it. I'm like, you'll be here all day. Just no. <laughs> I'd rather take like black box color all day than that. That's it just doesn't move. I don't know yeah. what is in that like crazy to me. <laughs> military formula that does not move. It's like insane. It's so crazy. So moral of the story, avoid splat. Splat. Yes. <laughs> if, if, you learn, if you learn if nothing else from this conversation, <laughs> no splat. <laughs> the one takeaway. <laughs> yeah, the one takeaway. So funny. Um, so if, any, if anybody wanted to use like fun colors on their hair, do you have a brand that you recommend that is like good for your hair and that you can kind of easily get out or, you know, is easy? Yeah, um, definitely like Manic Panic is still trying to do. Um, I know at Sally's, because you can buy it at Sally's, like the Ion, I-O-N, theirs is pretty good. Um, now they have really great um, condition colors. So you put them in and they say so it'll be like very vibrant and it'll kind of fade into the whole soft pastel so like those are cool but you just have to be mindful of if you're lightening your hair at home what you're using because then then it's like shredded but stuff like that like so and always too if you go to a salon they have the things they could sell you also so just don't just be really careful on what you put in your hair you yeah. know because it's very sad it's a sad day for all those involved. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for doing this and for sharing. No, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Where can everybody find you and your salon on um, all the socials? Sure. So the salon Instagram is at Bella Rococo Beauty. So it's B-E-L-L-A-R-E-O-C-O Beauty. Same thing with Facebook, same thing with Twitter. If you want to connect with me, my personal Instagram is I am Steph Glam, it's Steph with an F, then G L M M. Feel free to ask me any questions or send suggestions. I don't know, I'm here for it. And our website is Bella Rococo Hair Makeup.com. If you are in the New Jersey area, please come see us. Um, and yeah, that's all our, we don't have a YouTube channel yet. Maybe one day. Well, you could, well, might inspire me to have a YouTube channel. There's only so many hours in the day. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's, um, but pretty much the so, like Facebook and Instagram is the most up-to-date on what we're doing. And, um, you know, check us out. I would love to see anybody who wants to come in. 
Beautiful. Perfect. Um, and yeah, if you want to find us, we are on Instagram at untitled underscore women and on Twitter at untitled Meg. And stay tuned because we're going to be coming out with some more interviews and information soon. So make sure you subscribe. And thank you again, Steph, for being here. And we'll see you next time.